Okay, so our next guest speaker is a principal applied security researcher with FireEye's advanced practices team with over eight years of operations, security, and incident response consulting experience. He is the author of Invoke Obfuscation, Invoke Cradle Crafter, and Invoke Dospuscation. He has presented at numerous conferences, including Black Hat, USA, uh, DEF CON, Derby Con, and Blue Hat. Coming to the stage to present PesterSec, using Pester and Script Analyzer for detecting obfuscated PowerShell. Please give it up for Daniel Bohannon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was an awesome intro. That, uh, that, that makes this uh, really energetic and exciting. Um, so the very first caveat of today is when it comes to talking about obfuscation, you have to always keep people guessing and always try to evade what they're thinking. So the, the most eloquent way I could think to do that was to talk about something completely different. Um, so the, so the, there were two talks that I put together uh, for, for this week, and I was really debating. I was talking with Tim. I said, you know what? I, I think this other talk this one right here is going to be maybe a bit more interesting, and for sure, the memes are far more on point. So he said, man, that's, that's like our metrics right there, so let's go for it. So uh, the, the pester stack concept was more of looking at using uh, 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 some community tools called Pester and Script Analyzer to detect obfuscated PowerShell. I thought it would be fun to look at some in the wild samples uh, of, uh, of obfuscated PowerShell, uh, and then just kind of do a deep dive on some of those, and kind of make this like a buffet of, uh, of in the wild stuff. Uh, as a security person, uh, I realize that sometimes I, I kind of forget uh, and become a little bit numb to how interesting some of these techniques are. Um, and so what I want to do is share that with you, and I think we'll have a good time doing that. Um, so uh, my name is Daniel Bohannon. I'm super excited to be here. This is my very first SparkCon. Um, and uh, I, I'm a security researcher. Uh, and so I really like uh, PowerShell. I really like writing detections. And then I really like thinking adversarially about obfuscation and evasion. How can I break my stuff before an attacker does so that I can make it better to better protect our clients, our customers, and to share these learnings and these insights and failures in forums like this so that we as the greater community can all improve together. So a quick kind of overview. Uh, we're going to start with an intro because uh, that's, that's what needs to be done. And then we're going to look at several uh, in the wild examples of malicious PowerShell. All along the way, we're going to be looking at some forensic artifacts and some different detection approaches, because me, I'm a blue teamer. Uh, and so how, how do I approach um, some different ways of detecting this activity? Then we're going to dive deep into PowerShell's visibility that the PowerShell team has architected into the language, uh, some really, really awesome uh, uh, detective uh, measures that they've built in. And then we'll end with some more novel detection techniques, um, one of which uh, I, I have not talked about publicly before, uh, and then some key takeaways. Now, uh, an individual on my team said, hey, uh, everyone on my team, they call me Debo, because it's easier to say than Daniel Bohannon. Um, and so they said, hey, Debo, I know that you're usually you know, pressed for content, and you may be wondering what slides uh, to put in there. So they gave me this picture. And uh, I figured we would, we'd start with this one. Some frozen food for thought. So this is the son of one of our team members. Uh, running around a Walmart, uh, anyone who's into OPSEC can see it's in Virginia, so that tells you a little bit about what's going on, but wearing a Raptor hat, uh, you can see the claws going on there, and to top it off with the shark crocs, and uh, apparently there are some really good sound effects to go with this. Uh, I think my favorite is the lady in the back looking very confused at, what, at what's happening. I think a lot of people were scared that day. I don't know if there's official like, Walmart protocols for when this kind of stuff happens. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I had to throw that in there. I wasn't really sure how else to tie it into PowerShell. So I figured, you know what, maybe just be a good icebreaker. That's also a pun on the frozen part. So OK. My wife loves those jokes. So. Uh, so I've been in IT for nine years now. Uh, I've been uh, started in operations and got stuck into security. And for me personally, there have been two things that have been consistent across all the roles uh, in companies I've worked for. One, I'm obsessed with coffee, like badly obsessed. Uh, a connoisseur is a nice way of saying very obsessed. But I've also been an aspiring PowerShell aficionado. And I used PowerShell far before I got into security to operate, uh, to automate uh, my life to make it easier. But it was interesting because when I got into security, I found, you know what, attackers really like PowerShell as well. Um, and, and for me, the, it, it was kind of a, 
it was kind of weird to see this thing that I love so much to be used in really malicious ways. So what I, what I decided to do was to really focus in uh, early in my security career on PowerShell. How are attackers using it? How are we detecting it? But more importantly, what are the things we're not detecting and how can I help us get better at that? So that's what our team does. We track attackers, we see what are the methodologies that they're using, how can we better build detections for this, and how can we group and make sense of who these attackers are, the trends uh, that, that they're taking when it comes to attacking our clients and customers and those that even aren't our clients and customers so that we can better protect and help the community better understand and better protect. Now, something that may be surprising is a lot of people say, wow, some of these APT things you see are like super unsophisticated. And yeah, some of them are really basic because you know what? They still work. So I don't want you to get discouraged and think this is like kindergarten when we start with some of these samples because they're going to be really simple. But hopefully what you'll see is that even the things that start simple, at a certain point, the attacker has to add some evasion, some obfuscation, something different to keep defenders on their toes. Even with the last talk, talking about machine learning, there's different uh, changes they're gonna throw in to try to increase the amount of effort from a defensive perspective to both detect as well as prevent these kinds of attacks. And we see that evolution in the PowerShell arena of tradecraft as well. And lastly, all along the way, as a defender, I'm gonna be talking about ways that we go about detecting this kind of behavior. And hopefully some of the, some of the ideas shared here and in the questions that I'll be asked at the end of this talk as well as throughout this conference uh, will give all of us as defenders some more ideas of how we can go about detecting this. And as red teamers, some more ideas that we can help test our defenses and test our blue team to up our game together. So with that, this is gonna be a ride along. A day in the life, except instead of cruising streets, we me cruising some code. So on May the 4th, let's nerd out together. So some examples. First one, I'm starting super basic. I'm talking about stupid basic. This, this actually makes me like almost mad a little bit how basic this is, but we see it all the time. And that is attackers that use PowerShell just as like a glorified curl, just to do something real basic like this, to download an XE and execute it. How, how, how simple, like PowerShell can do so much more than that. Now, why do I bring up this example? I bring it up because it's very prevalent, this sort of thing, but also there's a lot of reports out there that talk about insane rises in PowerShell attacks. And a lot of people say, well, Microsoft, why did you build this horrible thing that attackers are using? And it's like, oh, you mean like code? Okay, well, uh, like, yeah, we could neuter a language, but then no one would use it, right? So there's this, this for sure, this trade-off and this balance. But a lot of these numbers are driven by really silly attacks that just download an executable. And you know what? That's not really a PowerShell problem. That's a problem of your users are able to enable macros and then run any arbitrary code. And the code of the day happened to be PowerShell. But they could have used CertUtil to download that same executable. They just chose PowerShell. But anyways, I digress. So here's a little function. It'll go through and download a file to disk. Um, you see a nice array in the middle where they'll throw in a couple of different uh, domains. Uh, and whenever one of them actually uh, is able to successfully download that payload, it will then start process to execute it that's it. Super, super simple. But attackers don't write their code nice and beautifully like this. They smash it all up into one piece, might throw some inline comments in there. And you know what? This works for a while. Uh, this works for quite a while, actually. But at some point, the attacker says, you know what? Enough of these payloads are being detected or maybe even prevented. So to keep their numbers up, they'll do something different. Like maybe they'll gzip, compress this sucker, right? And then they'll base 64 and code it. And so now what we see running on the command line isn't necessarily this top function, it's something like this, where you have the, in, in the dark gray here, you have the base64 encoded and compressed payload. So the first uh, order is to decode it from base64 string, and then they're gonna deflate it, throw it in this variable s, and at the very end you'll see s again, where they're uh, using a string reader, and then iex is PowerShell's uh, invoke expression, kind of the eval statement to evaluate what's there. So now, if you're a defender and you are used to looking for net.webclient, download string, download file, download data, whatever that we see in the original one, if you only are looking at, let's say, static files or process command line arguments, now you have to take this into account. So maybe we switch and say, okay, we're interested in colon colon from base64 string, uh, you know, compression mode, a few things like that. This is where PowerShell logging makes this a bit simpler 
but where I still believe that defense in depth is the best approach here. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. Next sample, PowerShell in your environment. Looking at how attackers will layer and start to distribute their overall attack into multiple pieces uh, to make it a, quite a bit more difficult for us as defenders to piece together everything we need to recreate and see what's happening. Uh, this is a sample from a blog post by a good friend, Dave Kennedy, uh, with the link right there that you can check out uh, this actual uh, attack. So what we then started to see is uh, PowerShell running just with IEX and then some randomly named environment variable, right? So if you only have command line logging, then this doesn't really tell you anything of what's being run, all right? Now let's say you have command line auditing and you also have parent process command line as well, which I'd highly recommend. Well, we see the parent process is this thing called MSHTA or the Microsoft HTML application host. Uh, MSHTA in this case is actually running command line JavaScript, uh, which is usually not a healthy thing, thing to see on the command line. It pretty much always means bad news. Um, and so we can see in the yellow portion here is a reference to uh, a registry key. There's a couple strings in purple, um, which originally I used to think these were just like garbage strings. In some cases they are, um, but sometimes it also just depends on what the rest of the payload is. Because what you can see is that this command line JavaScript is reading this registry key, and then it is evaling it. Now, this is not PowerShell evaling it. This is still JavaScript. So that means that likely it's more JavaScript under the hood that's stored in this registry key. So the hard part is that means that now as defenders, we have to go and retrieve that registry key as well. And typically, it's going to be massively obfuscated JavaScript. And attackers can actually chain this together to many, many, many registry keys. Um, and so it, it becomes more cumbersome, uh, especially if you're trying to do it in an automated fashion to retrieve all these pieces to see what's happening. But again, as we, in the later section, we'll talk about PowerShell logging to see that it actually doesn't matter where this code is stored, or even if it's there anymore, that PowerShell logging is super, super feature rich in showing us exactly what PowerShell code ran, no matter what process ran it, no matter how many places that the payload was distributed across. And it's really, really cool to see. Sample number three, PowerShell in your environment. Remember before how we said that attackers will keep using something until the, the, the cost becomes so great, their numbers are getting so low that they have to change something about it. The same is true here. So functionally, Starting with something like this and just an IEX for an environment variable, we then see attackers move to something more like this. Now, this is where I get super excited, right? Because I love this stuff. This makes me really happy. Uh, functionally, this does the exact same thing. Two pieces, IEX, environment variable. So let's break this down. We can see the environment variable portion is set in this code here, and then IEX is this nastiness right there. So let's break it down for IEX. Uh, when it comes to PowerShell, syntactically, tick marks can be removed from any unescapable character, right? So tick mark lowercase n is new line, but tick, uh, tick mark uppercase n means nothing, so therefore nothing special happens. But the tick marks still persist in the logging that is present. So as a defender, I want to beautify this code so I can then remove tick marks from variable names. Now once I do that, we may say, okay, well, well what in the world is this comspec variable? Well, comspec is 27 characters long, and it's the full path to command.exe on a Windows uh, system. So what this is doing from a PowerShell perspective is, is it's saying, in memory, expand this string, and now let's treat it as an array. And the fourth, 15th, and 25th characters happen to be IEX. Now, IEX joined together with nothing becomes the string IEX, and you can use the dot or the ampersand invocation operator in PowerShell, which means that in memory, this is the exact same as IEX. Pretty dirty, right? So that's what IEX translates to. The environment variable stuff uh, is, is kind of nasty as well. And so you'll notice this dash F. In PowerShell, this is called the format operator, which means is that you can take an array of uh, objects, typically they're going to be strings, on the right side of the format operator, and then place them, kind of reassemble them into the string on the left based on the curly braces and index of the array. So the first one, V-I-R-O, is green. That's going to be the zeroth element. That will then replace curly braces zero on the left side. So if we do that translation, then that becomes environment. Now in this case, so now we have the string environment. Uh, type is going to be a direct typecast in PowerShell, which is the same as making it be of type environment. And then what we'll see is that SV is short as an alias for set variable. So it's saying set this environment type into this variable S3ZXL5. 
Now the second part of the command we can see is using variable, which is a shortened, undocumented way to say get variable, because anytime you type something, PowerShell will automatically prepend a get dash to it to see if that's the name of a commandlet. Super fun. Uh, and so get variable says, all right, give me the value that tack VA is for value only. Uh, and then it says colon colon. So it's actually referencing this. So we can basically take environment and kind of drop it in there. Uh, and so now uh, we can then look at the rest of the payload, which is two more of these format operators. So let's clean up that. And what we see is that we have two more strings, get environment variable and process. And the process part is important because this is a process level environment variable, not a user level environment variable. And then we can clean it up a bit more. And this is the code that we have. So that's how we can uh, kind of decode and beautify this code to say this is functionally equivalent to IEX and then this environment variable name. All right. The last three examples are going to be more, uh, uh, they're going to be open source code uh, for some different uh, internal lateral movement tools as well as some, uh, some rats, some backdoors. So this one, crack map exec, uh, this is written by a guy named Marcelo. Uh, and it's actually a combination of three tools, uh, cred crack, SMB map, and SMB exec. Um, and we actually see this quite a bit. So crack map exec, uh, we typically see something like this. The earlier forms didn't look like this, uh, but uh, a coworker of mine uh, decided to uh, port some of the PowerShell obfuscation framework stuff into Python, which Marcelo wrote this crack map exec in. And so then very conveniently it showed up uh, all over the place in this tool. But what we have here is uh, an ASCII encoded payload. Uh, and you can see that very similar comspec IEX obfuscation at the beginning. So that translates to IEX. And then the rest of the payload here uh, is ASCII encoding. Uh, so we're going to basically convert it to a char array and then as a string, join it together with nothing, which is going to return in memory something that looks like this. Now, the whole, uh, the first portion of this is a try block to basically say, you know what? As an attacker, I recognize the value that PowerShell logging has. So why don't I try just to disable all the goodies that are there for this current session? And so one of the first things it goes after is AMSI or AMZ. Now, AMZ is really cool. It's the anti-malware scan interface. Um, and so it, basically, uh, Microsoft provides us as an interface for any registered AV vendors to hook in and get the visibility into not only PowerShell, but other scripting languages as well to make block, no block decisions based on every layer of unwrapped code. And this is going to be a very important uh, theme because every time you have these wrapped layers in PowerShell, it is going to be resolved by piping it into an IEX invoke expression, something similar. And every time it does that, in memory it unwraps it, but it also, in later versions of PowerShell, will log that information. AMSI is the gateway for a registered AV vendor to then see every layer and make a go, no go decision based on that. So this code says, yeah, I don't want any of that. Just go ahead and disable that. Very convenient for attackers. And as defenders, we have to look for the presence of these kinds of uh, attacks or, uh, or uh, disabling um, because everything after that, if it's successful, nothing else is going to show up. Um, the next part is going to ignore SSL cert validation um, because it's actually going to be uh, uh, calling an internal system. So this is actually an example of lateral movement using this tool. Um, and then the, the, the real meat is right here in the beginning. So it's going to do a small remote download cradle of the internal system. Uh, so this 10.250.210.55 is going to be the attacker system, which is hosting Invoke Mimikatz, which Mimikatz is one of the most prolific password dumpers we see used in the wild. Invoke Mimikatz is the PowerShell version of that, which it will run uh, or reflect, reflectively load that uh, binary in memory so it never hits disk, which is also convenient for attackers. Um, it's going to uh, remotely download that, load the function, and then call the function in the second yellow line there and store the results in the variable CMD. So it's hitting these systems dumping passwords, and then uh, it's going to then, at the end, uh, post the results back to the attacker system. <clears throat> so sometimes we see attackers using this, and they'll hit a couple systems at a time. And then sometimes they just get real greedy, or they've been told to like, go super noisy, and they'll just hit like 150 systems all at once. Um, so out of the box, if you're looking at what's available on GitHub for this project, there's uh, several things that you can key off of. But again, like the, the, a good attacker who's using this tool is going to make some changes. They're going to make some tweaks. Um, perhaps even after seeing this talk, to try to evade certain components of this. And that's why it's so important not to just focus on one or two, but to have like a dozen different ways that we're slicing and dicing this to, to identify this kind of activity. The next sample is a full-blown backdoor uh, written completely in PowerShell uh, called Empire, uh, written by uh, a buddy, Will Schroeder. Um, and uh, this one's quite interesting as well. I'll, for, for some of the more, uh, I guess, generic ways we see it launch is going to be a PowerShell encoded command launched out of like a you know, malicious document, maybe an HTA file, um, or just straight over WMI for, uh, for lateral movement. 
But this is an encoded command. It's a, it's a capability that PowerShell has out of the box to allow you to run a base64 encoded command on the command line. So if we decode this, we're going to see something like this, uh, a really attractive blob of mess. So if we kind of beautify this a little bit to make more sense of it, we can break it into kind of two pieces um, just based on the, side of, the size of the slides. So the first one, this entire if block says, if your PowerShell three or greater, I've got some words for you. Because this additional visibility, module logs, script block, and transcription logs that we'll talk about in a few more slides, uh, module logs was the first one that became available in PowerShell 3. So this code says I'm only going to try to disable this stuff if you're even a valid PowerShell version. And it's going to go through and try to disable script block logging, script block invocation logging, and then at the end we have a very similar, uh, familiar looking uh, AMSI bypass. Now, once it's done with that, it goes on to the second piece, um, which is going to uh, set up some the user agent string. It's going to disable, um, or it's going to uh, uh, set to use the default proxy. It's going to use the default credentials present. Um, this, uh, this dark portion here is actually an RC4 decryption routine. Um, so one of the things that will put a lot of effort into is uh, making this uh, cryptographically sound much more so than any of the other PowerShell specific rats at that time. And so I've kind of uh, expanded that code a little bit on the upper right um, for the RC4 uh, decryption. Now, what that means is, uh, that if, as a defender, we detect this command running, and then we go and retrieve that payload, it's going to be uh, encrypted. So unless we have this key as well, uh, then, then we actually don't know how to decrypt this and what to do with it. But that's where PowerShell logging is really convenient, because it logs the plain text code that ran, unless you know, those, all those disabling things worked at the beginning. The last one is Cobalt Strike. This one's not open source. Uh, it's a closed source, uh, commercially available rat. Um, but I think it's uh, actually one that we see uh, extremely often used by red teamers and attackers alike. And so I think it's worth looking at um, kind, of, kind of the more generic ways that we see this. Now, this is an example that we typically see um, run as a, a service, either locally for a nice, uh, you know, to run a system locally or also as a remote, uh, remotely created service. So. When it comes to detecting PowerShell running under a service, there's a lot of ways that we go about doing this. Um, one of the more common uh, ways in the industry is it's actually a good idea to look for newly created services, uh, which is going to show up in your system event log EID 7045. Now, an important thing to recognize here is that this only records the creation of a new service. It does not include the modification of an existing service. And there are for sure some really interesting attackers that will only modify existing services, or they'll create a super benign service and then immediately modify it with something malicious. And the, the EID 7045 is only going to show the benign thing. So what we recommend is to monitor the service uh, registry hive, or the, the registry path, to look for image path. And there's also a couple uh, additional things you'd want to look for there uh, regarding some DLLs, as well as if you go into services and right click to do some configuration, you can actually say, you know what, if this service fails on the first try, then after that, try something different. Or second try, try something even different. Third try, something different. And those are separate registry keys, not under image path. So an attacker could actually create a service that's something benign that they know will fail, and then they'll make their malicious thing be the second retry. Uh, and that's the one that, that runs. So as, as defer people, as defenders, we want to make sure that we're looking recursively uh, through all these services keys. Um, so when this runs, we'll see service, services.exe launch PowerShell, um, or in this case, it's actually going to be launching command.exe because that's what that comspec variable resolves to. Um, now, this, this comspec uh, command line arguments are interesting here, especially the start portion. This is because when Windows services launches, it's expecting it to be a service executable which means that when the service successfully starts, it will send the code back and say, as a service, I've successfully started. We're good. So that as a, an administrator, when I go and look at all my services, it'll say running, right? Everything's good. Everything's peachy. Well, if a service doesn't send that signal, then after like 30 seconds, it's going to say, hey, this failed to start. Log a nice error message, um, and, and, and that's, that's what it does. In this case, we're not running a service. We're hijacking services to run an arbitrary command. So after 30 seconds, services is going to say, hey, command.exe, you never sent me a signal back. So I'm assuming you actually didn't start correctly. So I'm going to kill you as a process and then log this failure. That's why this start command says, you know what, command.exe run, and then start as a separate process, background the uh, PowerShell, so that when command.exe is killed, PowerShell still runs. Now, uh, when I was first getting an incident response, the first several times I saw these event logs saying the attacker service didn't start, I thought, ha, 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 this attacker, their code didn't work. How funny. Well, no, it totally worked. It's just the fact that they weren't using a legitimate service. Uh, so definitely, uh, I, I would highlight, don't, don't be fooled by that. 
Uh, I, I received a good education that day as to why I was very wrong about that assumption. But isn't that what InfoSec is all about? Is learning from your peers, sometimes shaming a little bit, but in a good way, learning and getting better together. So I share that failure with you. So after we decode this command, we see something like this. Actually, it looks pretty familiar to the second example that we looked at, right? Base64 decode this massive payload. Then we're going to do some memory stream stuff. And it actually uses the same variable, s. There's actually a lot of overlap um, between a lot of these tools. Um, a lot of them look kind of metasploitish in nature in terms of kind of borrowing code, um, because as attackers, uh, we're all kind of lazy and like to copy and paste, because copy and pasting is more convenient. And then at the end, s comes down there. Uh, we decode it, uh, pull it out of the stream, and then uh, execute it with iex right there. So this is layer two, right? First layer, services command, PowerShell encoded command. We just decoded that. This is what we get. And so now if we base64 decode and uh, gzip decompress it, we're going to get something like this. Now, this is highly redacted just because it's super, super large. But basically, the whole first portion is this massive, in PowerShell, it's what's called a here string. So a big multi-line string in this variable called doit that's setting uh, some functions uh, for loading the shell code. And then at the end, we have this if block that is saying, uh, I want to know if I'm running on a 32 or 64-bit system. In this case, this is a 32-bit payload generated by Cobalt Strike. So the else block says, if I'm on a 32-bit system, just run this, just invoke it. But if I'm on a 64-bit system, uh, or sorry, a 64-bit uh, process, uh, then I want to create a child process to run as 32-bit. Now, this is a fascinating thing, because nowhere do you see start process, right? Or, or, uh, or a reference to PowerShell.exe. But this start job command is an interesting thing in PowerShell. It's actually going to create a child process uh, with some interesting uh, specific arguments by default that a lot of attackers don't take the time to look at, uh, but becomes quite an interesting uh, detection opportunity. Now, another point here is that let's say an attacker has renamed PowerShell.exe to benign.exe, and they did all this stuff. Well, if they're running in a 64-bit process, this start job will not respect the name of the process that he renamed it to, it will go under the hood and say, you are the PowerShell engine, therefore, start job will be PowerShell.exe in the proper path. And there's a few cases where under the hood, the actual true binary name is what is run as the child process. Um, so that's just an interesting artifact of start job um, that, that makes me happy. But it doesn't make me as happy as all the jokes that come out of do it, this do it variable. So just do it, oh man. Uh, and it's funny, sometimes we'll see attackers that'll say, like, don't do it, and they'll leave funny messages, um, sometimes even directly to some of our teammates uh, when they upload these things to VirusTotal. So, it, it, you know, it's really nice when attackers, like, keep things light and kind of keep things fun. The threatening messages aren't as much fun, but it, it's nice to know people do have a sense of humor. You know, at the other end of the keyboard, it's a real person, and hopefully some of those people have good senses of humor, um, but you really kind of start to, to kind of feel and, and start to, to follow around the same attackers and feel like you kind of, in a weird way, like know them. Not that you're happy to see them again, but you, you're kind of seeing them progress in their maturity and their coding skills and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> because sometimes the, can't, the same can't be said of myself, so I like to appreciate other people's uh, progress. Whew. All right, that was the buffet portion. All right, hopefully you're not too full. Uh, or sleepy. Um, so let's go a little bit deeper into some of the forensic artifacts and detection approaches. We already covered some of them. But what, what we tell people is, you know what, like, like this talk is really focusing a lot on the PowerShell visibility and PowerShell logging. But I will tell people, don't spend a single minute updating PowerShell logging if you don't even have process auditing. If someone runs calc and you don't have a way to say they ran calc, you need that first, far more than you need PowerShell logs. So get the process creation information. Your security 4688, uh, and specifically, there's some nice KBs that you can update too if you're running on Windows 7. Um, hopefully, you're running on newer than that. But if not, you want to make sure that you're getting process command line arguments as well. And there are some settings that you can, uh, that you can apply to also give you parent process and parent process arguments as well. That's where the money's at. Now, let's say you're in a situation in which you can't do that. Well, you can also use Sysmon uh, EID1, which will give you out of the box that and a lot more. It's important to know this is not an officially supported tool by Microsoft, but plenty of people treat it as such, so it's kind of like this weird gray area. But out of the box, just, uh, just running it, a separate driver, it actually does some really, really cool stuff. Uh, and I'm certainly a fan of it, especially for local testing. Um, but it is, again, officially not supported as of the, you know, today. Uh, service creation, I mentioned 7045s, but again, also looking at the registry. How can we monitor uh, both, for, uh, both historically for uh, evidence of historical uh, uh, maliciousness, as well as in real time changes to uh, these registry keys, um, as well as other common persistence location. 
run, run once, uh, startup folders, like, like whatever you can think of, and then some of the more novel places like WMI repositories, like classes, class properties, custom class properties, uh, some really interesting stuff has been found in those places by some pretty gnarly attackers. Parent-child process relationships. By no means is this foolproof, but by every means this is still super valuable every day uh, for detecting these kinds of relationships. Um, so we looked before at services launching command launching PowerShell. That is an extremely suspicious thing to look for, right? Uh, as well as looking for a percent comp spec showing up in the registry anywhere or in that 7045 event. Um, a lot of uh, attack tools will just reference that comp spec variable instead of pathing out command.exe. I kind of like to group this into categories. So if we're looking just at PowerShell, then I'll kind of look at big buckets of parent processes. So like how often in my environment should an Office application be launching PowerShell either directly or as a, 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 a descendant process, uh, as well as like email applications, web browsers. And there's this whole category of like middleware, web server, databases that you can find some really interesting stuff. Now, I'm going to be the first to admit I'm quite jaded because we don't work in a single environment. When we write detections, we have to make it work for millions and millions and millions of computers all around the world in environments that we can't say, hey, this is a really bad thing you're doing here. You should stop that. We don't have that luxury. So a lot of times I'll think about something and say, oh, that's a bad idea. I've tried it and it failed, failed hard. But it actually might be a really good idea in your environment. So I've tried to become a lot better to say, I've tried that in our context and it doesn't work across hundreds and thousands of environments, but maybe it's a great idea for you. And this is where fail fast, try new things is really, really important in your environment. Um, I, I like to document as well all the things that didn't work because a year later, they actually might work because I'm a better person a year later and I know more. And some of the best ideas uh, that personally I, I've had have been from going back to my notes of things that didn't work yet and then thinking, oh man, I actually know something else about this, or I talked with this person, and now maybe this, yep, there it is, that's it, that's, that's the key, that's what worked. So documenting your failures is a super, super important step when it comes to, uh, to, to, to research. And research is really a fancy word. It just means looking at stuff. It means spending a silly amount of time on something instead of something else, right? Like, when it comes to all the PowerShell obfuscation stuff, most of those projects ended up being around 1,000 hours for me with the research, with the code, and about 100 hours on slides because I'm real, real OCD when it comes to that. Now, I chose to do that instead of going for a hike, which maybe I should have done, right? So it's all about trade-offs. I, I, I would acknowledge there are a, a handful of super, super brilliant people in this world that are next level. Everyone else, they just chose to spend a lot of time on something. So I say that as an encouragement because I'm encouraged when I go to conferences and see stuff, even that like the machine learning stuff, it's like, oh my gosh, that guy spent a lot of time on this stuff and he's really good at it and it shows. Could I be that good at it? I might be able to actually make some progress towards that if I said this is the thing I would like to spend an inordinate amount of time on. So anyways, that's my inspirational soapbox. Let's keep going. Parent-child process relationships, we talked about that. What I like to also do as another layer is say, I have a decent idea of what a lot of this malicious PowerShell looks like that we've seen in the wild. So why don't I start to look for those very specific things anywhere I can find it. Anywhere I can run a query, I want to look for this stuff. So how about instead of just looking at services and run keys in the registry, I just want to look everywhere. Maybe I'm going to find this weird com persistence or startup hijacking in registry that now has this code that I know is bad, but I now have to kind of backtrack and say, well, what's the context of this code? This is definitely bad, but I don't understand what's actually going to load this. Same with things like WMI. Um, and also, uh, like a lot of people will say, well, so for encoded commands, when an encoded command runs in my environment, we decode it and then we apply the signatures. That's awesome. That saves you a lot of steps. However, I would still encourage you to, how about you consider also taking the original layer and writing detections against that base64 encoded content. Yes, you have to deal with camel casing that's going to mess it up. Yes, you have to deal with the three possibilities for any one possibility of an input string for the base64 encoded option. But what does that buy you? Well, how about it buys you every scenario where that code never ran in your environment? For us, a lot of our clients don't have that logging enabled when we come to visit them and their house is on fire. So we have to play to the lowest common denominator. But what that means is that we put in that effort up front, and now we can write YAR rules and search public repos and find encoded commands even two to three layers deep because we've recursively gone through and generated those signatures and those capabilities. And now we can start to pull other people's payloads out of VirusTotal and other locations, even across the wire, without ever seeing it run. Because if an attacker puts that encoded command in a persistence location in my environment and they schedule it to run six months from now, I want to be able to find it far before six months before it has ever even had a chance to run. 
So that's the kind of defense in depth stuff uh, that I get really excited about, if you can't tell, because I love snagging that sort of information, especially when we had no reason to be able to do it. Same thing for, uh, for network stuff. So I love writing uh, network detections for command line arguments, which usually doesn't make sense, but there's really weird scenarios in which attackers are pushing their commands over SMB, as well as a lot of, um, a lot of data, data gathering jobs, like SCCM jobs finishing a uh, service audit, posting it back, and let's say the agent never deployed, uh, the client never deployed an agent on that system, but we have network sensors and now we can catch that malicious payload being transferred over the wire, right? So as many layers as we can get, we start to find all these little wins and piece them together into something really exciting. All right, so that was some of the more like obscure, like uh, kind of detection approaches uh, and some of the defense in depth stuff that I get really excited about because most people that we interact with don't have PowerShell logging enabled. And when they do, it's like, it's like going crazy in a candy store. It's like, look at all this data. All the scripts are here. Let's start extracting all these scripts. Like, how cool is that? In comparison to other languages, when it comes to logging, PowerShell is like bananas ahead of the pack. The amount of visibility that PowerShell can give you is superb. However, you got to be careful when you walk into that, because it can freak you out. And you want to know who else it'll freak out is whoever's running storage for all that data. You say, yo, I want to flip all these logs on. They're going to be like, oh, yeah, it's going to cost how much? So like your sim salesperson might really support this effort. Um, but it, it, it definitely is an overload. Like personally, I, I can attest to that. So don't freak out. Let's look at these different kinds of, uh, of logging in PowerShell. We have module logging introduced in PowerShell 3. And then after that, in later versions, we have script block and transcription logging. Now, the first one we're going to look at is transcription logging or over-the-shoulder logging. Um, so over-the-shoulder logging is going to give you standard input and standard output of what is run in PowerShell. Now, there's kind of like, like a stepbrother to transcription logging I'm going to talk about first. I remember Matt Graber tweeting this out in 2016, and it blew my mind. Uh, and this has been a, an insanely valuable artifact for a lot of the investigations that we've done and continue to do. That is, if you're in a later version of PowerShell and you have an interactive PowerShell session, like hands-on keyboard interactive, not PowerShell remoting, then it, every command that you enter is going to be written directly to disk in this console host history.txt file. Now, this exists because if you open up one session and type some commands and then close that session, if you open another window and immediately just hit the up arrow, it's actually going to show the commands from the other completely different session. That's because it's reading from this file. It, even if you type git history, it's not the history of that session. It's the history of past sessions. But it actually doesn't delineate between like, what time the command was run, what user ran it, what session it came from. So it is a little bit to be lacking, but this is a for sure awesome resource if you're doing an investigation to check out these files. There's also a, a read line uh, uh, history file that's a bit more obscure. Um, but they're, it's an interesting one to look at if you're pulling this one as well. So that's kind of like the stepbrother of transcription. But the real transcription logging looks like this. When the session starts up, it gives you tons of information about the username, system name, current directory, all that jazz. And then every command, it will give you the time. And not only will it give you the input command, but it will also give you the output. Right? So if as an attacker, I run git command and I'm looking for this Yoda, right? then I can then say invoke Yoda, and that, that function doesn't exist. And that entire error message we see in red is actually stored in transcription logging as standard output. That's really cool. And now if you think about if you're investigating an attacker that's doing a directory listing of the stuff they're about to zip up and exfil out, you literally have the exact view that they're getting of all the files sitting in that directory, file sizes, all that stuff. So really, really super capability. And the nice thing is that with transcription logging, you can configure it to log to a remote file share. So always trying to think about how can I get these logs off of this system in case an attacker tries to delete it. You can log this straight off to a, a mounted uh, file share, which is really, really nice. Module logging is the second one. Module logging is like the most verbose and honestly the most overwhelming in my opinion. Um, it's not typically the thing I recommend that people tackle first, but it will also give you every commandlet, every function that runs, as well as the input and output and the results from that. So we can see the same error message stored in module logs here. Now this is a really interesting difference. This is the original Windows PowerShell event log, EID 800, but most people will only talk about, and usually for good reason, the newer uh, PowerShell operational log, EID 4103, is the equivalent module log there. Now, there are some slight differences. And actually, if you look really closely, the error message says the term dot slash invoke Yoda, 
not just invoke Yoda. There's some really interesting hijacking opportunities, mainly for offense, but also a little bit for defense that I've not seen many people, I don't think I've seen anyone actually talk about it, where in PowerShell three or later, you have this thing called auto module loading, which is really weird because it'll search disk before it searches its own like uh, loaded commandlets in certain situations when you first start a program. So I'll leave it at that, that's, that's another talk. But uh, there's some really weird, weird stuff here that this newer log will kind of start to expose to you that the older one doesn't. So if you want to chat about that, we can, uh, we can do that afterwards. So now, the first time I come across these payloads and it's obfuscation, me being the obsessive obfuscator, it's really cool to be like, oh man, I know what base 64 is, I'm gonna decode this, unwrap this package, I know what gzip is, I'm gonna decompress this, I know what this is, and you feel really confident that you're unwrapping all this stuff, and you get to the last layer and you're like, look at this horrible code, it's so malicious. I'm an awesome defender, right? You just feel really good and you find what's at the end of the tunnel. Well, very quickly, when you do this all day, every day, you become like dead inside. And the joy of Christmas is like long gone. And when your colleagues have this feeling and they look at you and they're like, you did this, then you feel really intimidated and then you move somewhere else, right? No, but this is where PowerShell logging PowerShell logging can literally restore the joy of Christmas for D for analysts. It really can, because it makes you not have to think through every single layer and scenario to be able to detect every one. We still do because of the value I talked about earlier, but you don't have to, because you can dictate these changes in your environment. You can enable this logging, and then you have visibility into every layer sitting right in your strip lock logs, which is insanely, insanely cool. So, May the 4th, let's go back to that Yoda example. Oh, no, 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 there we go. So, as an attacker, I very maliciously threw up uh, this invoke Yoda function with some nice ASCII art on the paste bin, created a bitly link to point to it, and then as an attacker, I opened up, did a quick uh, remote download cradle to load the function, and then ran invoke Yoda to get this phenomenal ASCII art that I cannot take credit for, other than the fact that I found it and copied and pasted it, and I'm giving credits to the authors right there. If we look at the PowerShell operational 4104 events, we see the full payload. Now this is the payload that was hosted remotely. It never hit disk. If an attacker ran this attack and then immediately pulled down that payload, as a defender, I might not ever be able to get my hands on that from that source online. But these logs capture the entire thing. So let's roll a demo to look at what this can look like especially when you start to get uh, into deeper and deeper layers of obfuscation and combining different kinds of obfuscation, um, it can get uh, pretty nasty pretty fast. So uh, I, th these are some obfuscation tools that I've built over the past few years um, because I'm addicted to ASCII art in colors. Um, it helps me feel like I'm using my time wisely and it is really fun to watch for me. Um, but basically, to show how easy an attacker can do something like this, let's say they have that remote payload, right? They're going to go into this tool called uh, Invoke Cradle Crafter, set the URL to be this bitly link to Invoke Yoda, and they're going to set the post cradle command to be Invoke Yoda, so after it's loaded, it'll run. They can then go to any memory or disk based cradles, uh, go through, play around, it'll show you nice uh, information about behaviors of the download cradle, artifacts, stuff like that. You can just throw in a couple numbers. Um, you can, uh, you can then take that payload using uh, substitution obfuscation and bring it into the next tool, invoke obfuscation. Invoke obfuscation will take any arbitrary input PowerShell script or command and allow you to perform multiple layers of obfuscation. The first one we did was token layer, and there's certain evasive uh, uh, artifacts that are nice from doing that first. Um, and then we can then wrap it up into hex encoding. Now we're at 4,244 characters. We can then copy that into a PowerShell session and run it and show that it unwraps all the layers and runs the payload. Now that would be really frustrating to try to detect every layer statically, but we can look at the event logs and see it loaded, or it logged the full remote payload. That's pretty cool in my opinion. Now let's be a really bad forensicator and delete those logs for the sake of this. Uh, and let's do one more thing. So we're gonna go back and copy that original obfuscated command. Um, this just shows that you can actually, no matter how the PowerShell code is launched, it's still gonna be logged. So this is the last project I worked on called invoke DOS obfuscation, which is using command.exe obfuscation. So we're gonna input that PowerShell command as the payload there. Then we're gonna set the final binary to be PowerShell. So that means we're gonna take this payload, wrap it in command.exe obfuscation, which has special escaping there, that's also handling PowerShell specific escape wrapped inside of command specific escaping. That's me just saying I spent way too much time on that part to make it work. So I, that's why I recorded this demo uh, because I have to get a little bit of credit for that 
Um, although I get plenty of those dirty looks in the office, which I guess is kind of credit if you think about it that way. But we're going to take that payload and we're going to choose a four coding option, which is going to say in command.exe, I'm going to take all the unique characters up to 8,000 characters, just shy of the 8,192 character limit of command.exe. And then we're going to take all those unique characters, throw it into a variable, and then set indexes. So now we throw it into command.exe in, st in standard output. It's going to be in memory reassembling the full payload, and then pipe that into PowerShell standard input, run the payload. Even though we had PowerShell obfuscation wrapped in command obfuscation and launched it from command, we can see the final payload and every stage of unwrapped code in PowerShell logging. Now that is really awesome. And that's what, that's what the PowerShell team has offered up on a silver platter. And it's sad how few people take advantage of this. So quick recap. This is the original uh, invoke cradle crafter command that we came out with. Then we threw it into one layer of token layer obfuscation and invoke obfuscation. Then we went hex encoding up to those 8,000 characters. Um, and then if we go back again, we took that original obfuscated command, threw it into dosfuscation to get that for loop, uh, for coding, and it's something like that. Now, I guarantee you, you don't want to be writing regex just to look for each of those layers, because I've done it, and it's real painful. Uh, and you actually get rules taken off of virus total because they're too computationally intensive, which is a really funny story. But the guy, Victor Alvarez, is like one of the nicest humans I've ever like, virtually met. Uh, and he's super nice, even offering to help me like, update my rules to make them more efficient, because it's like, causing like, serious issues. But that's another, another story for another time. If you're not, if you're not, if you never push something hard enough to like, kind of break it a little bit, and if there's not that freedom to kind of fail and to cause some waves, then you might not be trying hard enough. But that totally depends on your environment, right? Like there's certain risk factors and risk profiles you gotta take into account, and you for sure want your managers back on that. So as defenders, when we're investigating attackers and they're in an environment where this logging is there, like, man, it's awesome. The visibility is insane. And not that we should be getting arrogant as defenders, but like, it's really cool to know there's this thing that's available. We implemented it. We took the time to roll this stuff out and look at the payoff here. Novel detection approaches. Um, so all this signature stuff we talked about, we definitely use quite a bit, and we see a lot of value out of it, right? But we also want to say, well, how about, how about we throw some data science in the mix? And so I became uh, good friends with Lee Holmes from Microsoft, who actually literally helped write PowerShell. Um, and so we teamed up back in 2017 uh, and did this research that we presented at Black Hat and DEF CON. Uh, where we used uh, machine learning, um, although we never used that word in the presentation. We said data science to help people feel like, hey, like, come, come, come check this out. Like, because uh, machine learning sometimes can sound intimidating, although after that last talk, uh, it feels less intimidating and a lot more uh, approachable. So that was really awesome. And so what this uses is it basically uses what's called the abstract syntax tree to break out any input PowerShell command or script into almost 5,000 features and uses uh, uh, some uh, data science to basically go through and say without a single static detection, without a single signature, is this obfuscated or is it not? Um, PesterStack is, uh, is what I was going to be talking about today, but hopefully you found this more interesting. But you don't really know because you haven't seen PesterStack, so you'll just have to take my word for it. But PesterStack is kind of this weird in-between, right? It's using the abstract syntax tree to go through and drill down to the very specific uh, tokens of PowerShell language to write very targeted signatures. So you can literally do things like, say, uh, retrieve any single uh, member token or method uh, and then compute the amount, like the ratio of special characters to alphanumerics. And if it's greater than 27%, flag this as uh, obfuscated. And so you can write those really, really specific ones. And, and this was in response to just after uh, Lee and I released Revoke Obfuscation, uh, this really awesome dude named Ryan Cobb uh, released this tool, tool at DerbyCon called PS AMSI, which uses the abstract syntax tree with a specific AV vendor's signatures to produce minimally obfuscated uh, PowerShell code which is a real dirty trick, but man, I sure do admire it. Uh, and so it got me thinking, how can we write uh, targeted signatures for minimally obfuscated PowerShell code? Uh, fingerprinting abnormal scripts. I've not heard of anyone doing this, um, but basically we could take a PowerShell commander script and use the AST to compute all of the, let's just start with commandlets, all the commandlet names. You could also do the same thing by taking those uh, EID 800 or EID 4103 uh, and group on, um, what is it, uh, pipeline ID and command name. Now what this will let you do is, let's say that we download invoke mimikatz, and then we tokenize it, and then we group on commands. If we look at that code and, and sort by uh, count, we'll see that the most common commandlet in invoke mimikatz is out null. And you actually see in the source code here for all these defined literals, it's piping it out null. Now as a defender, I'm sure not gonna write a detection on that, 
because a smart attacker would, instead of using pipe out null, they'll just put dollar sign null at the beginning of every line equals, and now they've just reduced their, uh, their uh, log count by 213, because they have 213 fewer commandlets. But what I will do as a defender is go through and say, which of these commandlets are less likely to be tampered with, and how often would I ever see a script in my environment calling add member 95 times? Like, that's real weird. And maybe even more than like five times as weird in my environment. And maybe I'd like to know that. Now this is an example where if an attacker is applying token layer obfuscation, then doing the AST-based approach is gonna really be gnarly. And so that's why I'd recommend doing it on both so that the code that actually runs in the module logs will show add member even if it's super obfuscated from a token layer and the AST can't parse that out. But that's getting really into the weeds. The high level is we can extract metadata about PowerShell code and scripts and then start to kind of form profiles of known bad and look for it, or in our environment, form profiles of known good and look for deviations. That's called baselining, and a lot of people say, just baseline your environment, and it's freaking hard. So I'm definitely not saying this is easy. If it was, it would already be done, but it's just some other kind of weird novel approaches that I really don't hear people talking about that much. Um, and it's definitely not going to be 100% true positive, but for sure, if you're this forward-leaning uh, environment or uh, uh, a person and your environment is on lockdown and you're looking for that next step, this could be an interesting way to do that. And the caveat I'll say here is that all the stuff in this talk is looking at uh, detection, not even prevention. So PowerShell has a whole other set of really awesome preventative capabilities that you definitely want to check out, like constrained language mode, uh, GEAR, just enough administration, some really awesome stuff there. So if you're that forward-leaning uh, environment, you definitely want to be looking at the preventative stuff so you don't even have to deal with looking at some of this detection stuff. This last one is one that I've never talked about publicly um, until like two days ago, so it's still not online. That is, there's one beautiful difference between the old module logs in EID 800 and the new 4103. And I want to point it out to you. So module logs, again, is going to show a separate log for every single command that is uh, invoked, as well as like the argument that comes in in standard output, right? So in this case, uh, if we have those attackers that are just running PowerShell, invoke expression, and then some environment variable, right? Invoke expression is the command name that runs. So in these module logs, we're going to see the command invocation is invoke expression, but the piece that the old log has that the newer PowerShell operational log doesn't is it actually has this command line field. It has it in two places, which says the commandlet that was run is invoke expression, but this is the text from which it came. And it's, it's easy to see invoke expression is sitting in the command line, right? There's no shenanigans going on here from an obfuscation perspective. It's very one-to-one. -one. Well, what if an attacker uses IEX, one of the aliases instead? Okay, well, invoke expression is still the command that ran, but we don't see it in the command line, but we can recursively go through and say, yeah, but do we see any of the aliases of this command? One of those is IEX. Okay, we see that in the command line, no shenanigans. But what if an attacker starts to do some token layer obfuscation and they put a tick mark in the IEX? Now, the command that ran is called invoke expression, but we don't see invoke expression anywhere in the command line, nor do we see any of its aliases IEX. Foul play, right? Now, what if an attacker did that crazy obfuscation for IEX and used that comspec stuff? The exact same thing holds true. At the end of the day, this code block, something about this code block made invoke expression be the command that's run, but invoke expression nor any of its aliases are found in the script block, in the command line that came, right? That's really cool to me, and the fact that this is all in a single event. You don't have to do any aggregation, any correlation. It's all in one event. It's a really nice way to start to do some diffs to say, if I find this value here, but not these values here, then I call foul play. Now, for sure, there are opportunities for false positives here, especially if you have a lot of like remote download cradles and stuff like that. That can get a little trickier. But for the most part, this is actually a really interesting technique to me, at least. And again, I, I've not... Uh, I've not heard anyone talking about this, um, and it's one of the things I really like about the old version of the event log as opposed to the new one. Key takeaways. PowerShell is powerful. Why else would you have insanely passionate communities of people using it every day to make their lives better, to automate, uh, to, to make ASCII art even, right? Like, it's a really fun language, uh, and it's a really nice way for people to get into scripting and coding if they're intimidated by some uh, other languages. Uh, Attackers also love it because it helps them do their job. And there's tons of offensive tradecraft. They can just copy and paste straight from GitHub. So why wouldn't they use it? What I tell people is that so some people say, well, these reports came out and said, oh, PowerShell, you know, malicious users on the rise. We need to get rid of it, disable it. 
It's kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. At the end of the day, you got to do you. It's your environment. I'm not responsible for your environment, but what I advise people is upgrade the PowerShell, get the defensive logging in place, get the preventative measures in place, and it can be far more of your biggest asset than a liability. And when you look at these reports, how many of those numbers of this crazy rise of PowerShell is just these silly downloaders just downloading an executable, right? That's not really a PowerShell problem, but again, you have to do you, you have to risk, you have to kind of weigh your own risk profile for you personally as well as your environment. Um, and so do what's best for you, but that's just my two cents on that. Tons of offensive tradecrafts in PowerShell, um, but there's also a plethora of de defensive uh, and forensic opportunities for detection as well as all the preventative measures that come in. Uh, and the very last thing I'll say is that, again, when hopefully this is your environment, and if it is, I just want to give you the biggest high five in the world after this. If you are the environment that has this logging enabled, you're running PowerShell 5, you have the, de the, the, the detection, the prevention in place, then when an attacker comes into your house, the visibility that you have is next level. And it feels really good. And again, if this is you, I'm so proud of you and I want to meet you because I see not enough people that have this in place, but it's really awesome to meet folks that say, you know what, it's not just a me thing, it's my team, it's my organization. There's buy-in at all the right levels to do this well and to do this right. So with that, I just want to say thank you very much for your time. This has been awesome. I know we have a couple of seconds for questions, but if you want to talk afterwards and just in the hallways, I'm around and excited to meet you. So thank you very much. Hey. We'll, we'll do Q&A, but before we do, I want to remind everyone, it is 1057 Central Time, which means it's three minutes to DerbyCon ticket ordering. So if you're into that, that's what you want to do. Now's your chance. This is your last reminder. Go hop in and play the game. Um, for those of you that are sticking around, though, we'll go ahead and ask some questions for Daniel. And then also another little thing, lunch is on its way. It'll be here in a little bit. So we'll do some Q&A if you guys want to then fill out, uh, fill out for bathroom break or whatever. We'll let you know when the, bat, when the lunch is here. It'll be served coming in this corner up here. But in the first, first part, though, does anyone have any questions for uh, Daniel? Surely there's some. By the way, the, the, the comments were, it was hard to keep up with on Twitter just during this. You have so much to look forward to. Uh oh, <laughs> that's a little hey, intimidating. Hey, Daniel, my hey. name's Bradley. Uh, I've got a question um, for someone who has a C++, C Sharp background mm -hmm. and is trying to use PowerShell to help with OSD and help his team with that kind of sysadmin work. Why is, I guess, PowerShell so loose of a language? <laughs> compared to these strongly typed languages yeah. that I'm familiar with as a software developer. In your presentation, I saw things like where these classes have just mixed capitalization, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Why, why is that a thing? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. So uh, I was in Seattle this week at the North American PowerShell Summit, and someone asked uh, Jeffrey Snover, the, the guy who literally created PowerShell, that question. And he said, because I make typos a lot. So I have a lot of aliases to make stuff easy, right? So right. It, it, it's awesome from a usability perspective because if you want to do a directory listing, if you come from Windows, you're going to type dir. If you come from Linux, you're going to type ls. But like get child item is the official way to say that in PowerShell, but it, it accepts those different aliases and like several others. Mm -hmm. um, the, yeah, the, the casing is super loose. Like I, I think, so PowerShell is written on top of C Sharp. And it's actually like, it's like Microsoft's beautiful trick to get people like to think they can't code, but to start with something like PowerShell, like, oh, I can make progress here. And then at a certain point when they get super deep into it, let's say if they're really trying to squeeze out all the performance they can, then maybe they'll start dropping down into C Sharp a little bit, right? So actually in Revoke Obfuscation, uh, in writing that, that uh, module, there were several scenarios in which Lee said, we need to have this run in like, in like, like less than a millisecond. And I was like, well, how is that possible? He's like, well, here, let's take this certain portion, write it in C Sharp, and then we can just add type in PowerShell. And so the mix and match is actually really quite interesting. Um, and it's a nice way that maybe you can start to help the, the PowerShell people in, in your environment to start to kind of understand when it actually makes a lot more sense to pull in some C-sharp code, even if PowerShell is still the thing that orchestrates it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's definitely quite loose from a usability perspective. But from a defender's perspective, it's insanely frustrating because there's so many, it's like, it's like, it's like trying to nail jello to a tree. It's just, it's like you, can't, you can't nail it down, right? That's a very Georgia thing to say, I realize. But, uh, but yeah, so I, I feel your pain there. I don't know if that answered uh, fully your question. It, it definitely helps. Thank okay. you. Yeah, awesome. G great question. Thank you. Any other questions? Walk up to the mic. 
Yeah. Hey, Daniel, I've in a previous organization, I had enabled PowerShell logging. Have you found when you're making that uh, recommendation to organizations, it's breaking anything internally that is natively supported by Windows that Windows is using on the server side or with SCCM that you need to then build in exceptions for? Do you mean breaking stuff like just from like a, uh, an in, uh, not input, like just from like a volume perspective or actually breaking functionality? Functionality. I, I've not seen that from a logging perspective. It sounds like maybe you have and you have some good insight to offer there. Was it, was it mainly just like the, uh, the more in-depth PowerShell logging or some of the preventative measures like constrained language mode or just enough administration? The, what, why I enabled remote transcript logging, it, bre it broke the Active Directory uh, Administrative Center, uh -huh. so you can no longer launch that on server 2012, 2016. You actually had to disable that and log remote uh, on disk Really? In order for it to, to run properly. I, I've not heard that. That's actually quite an interesting scenario. So I, I'm curious what, what version of PowerShell that has been, and maybe they've updated it since then, but that, that's an excellent insight. I'm, I'm Four and sure. five. Four and five, okay. Well, so maybe, I wonder if they've updated that in PowerShell core. I don't know. The, the nice thing is that PowerShell is open source now, so you can even go in and do a pull request. I mean, not that it's like the easiest thing in the world to do, because it's a lot of code there, but, but yeah, that's interesting. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Cool. But, well, I, I've been interested in chatting more later to, to, to find out more about that. Thanks for the comment. Any other questions? Yeah, there's one more. So my name is Bill. My uh, question is, what kind of advice would you have for an organization trying to tighten their security to prevent things like disabling, you know, like AMSI bypass, preventing malicious downloads in the first place? Obviously, it's sort of a network layer. You could help with that, but... Yeah. But is there ways to do that, group policy? So I, I, at, at this PowerShell Summit, I was asking the same question when it comes to pr actually preventing the disabling of some of these mechanisms, right? Th there are some tools that will use registry to do that, but when you're doing it within the session, like it's actually a non, it, it has historically been a non-serviceable thing that when Graber tweeted that out, he'd already worked with MSRC and they said, this is not something that we can or plan to service. So. It, in terms of preventing at like the host level, I'm honestly not sure. I, I, I've not found a good way to do that. Uh, if someone has, I'd be super interested to, to hear that. Um, but, but yeah, just like, like the, the best I can say is from a detection perspective is making sure you have all the stuff enabled and then looking for the presence of that, uh, of that disabling happening. That, 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 that's the best that I've seen clients do and the best that I've seen done personally. Um, but, but yeah, definitely interested in brainstorming if there's a better idea. Sorry that's not the most positive answer, but it's a great question. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions? So thanks for pointing the logging out, making it easier to, to detect things. So if an attacker wanted to make that harder for you, if they started creating new PowerShell processes, would the logs correlate all that? Or would that be separate event logs? Excellent question. Yeah, so, the, so every PowerShell log is going to have... Um, uh, not, there's a run space ID, there's one other ID, I'm, I'm blanking on the name right now, but it'll basically say for any, it's like script ID or something, where you can basically start to group together and extract the full logs, uh, even if it's run for multiple sessions, even like a remoting session and a local. So in the revoke obfuscation uh, work that Lee and I did, there's a separate function called git rvo script block. You can point that to an EVTX file, EVT file, uh, you can do w a remote querying, and it will actually go through and do that grouping for you and extract the full scripts just as a PowerShell object. You can also dump it the disk, and it will go through and find all the unique PowerShell scripts that are, that are found distributed across those uh, event logs. Um, so it kind of takes some of the guesswork out there. But yeah, it actually does a really nice job of grouping it together. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that if you have like the, the default like 15 meg event log size, like one run of mini cats can literally roll your whole log. So like enabling, like even if you're not forwarding all your logs off to a centralized system yet, like just increasing the log size is super important. But excellent question. I think it's almost derby time, DerbyCon ticket time, so. Yeah, want, if you want to do that, just I don't want people to be bail. mad at me for, so, for making them skip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's over, they're already sold. <laughs> Are they really? Yeah. Did anyone in the room get any tickets? You Adam gotta watch did. yourself. That's dangerous to admit. Okay, so, yeah, I, I know both you guys, and I, I know you're probably gonna get bum rushed later, so. <laughs> um, awesome, a couple. Um, really interesting interactions on Twitter here I'd like to call out. Uh, ben Byford had this really amazing, very pithy uh, tweet. Aren't, you, aren't you, really, you really proud of this tweet right now? Is that your PowerShell embedded in GZIP and converted to base64? Are you just happy to see me? So Ben, you win one of our books today. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> <coughs> 
Um, Beth, I, Beth Young, where are you? Uh, I, I love that you said there's so much information to tweet and listen to at the same time. I need to watch the session again and again and again. Uh, we've got, by the way, the, the, the prizes that we're handing out, we have signed copies of the uh, Tribe of Hackers book that came out. So you guys are all getting them. So you, you do want to track me down later. And then the Jason Holcomb, where are you? Where's Jason? Right there. You actually had two. Um, the, I mean, you already, he had already won before this one came in. So when this came in, it was just like icing on the cake. The food may be frozen, but the jokes and memes are hot. And I learned some things about PowerShell techniques and detection approaches. Thanks for sharing. And then the other one. Nope, that's the same one. Uh, PowerShell logging can restore the joy of Christmas for defer analysts. So I really love that. So you guys, all three of you did it. And then lastly, there's a, uh, one of our associates in South Africa actually interacted with us, Stanley Langa. I know you're streaming and watching this. He's not in the room. We're going to send you a book because you had an, a, a really good one as well. Um, if your power, PowerShell version is 3.0 or greater, I have some words for you. So um, Stanley, thank you very much for interacting. And I think it's kind of cool that we get to do this event where we get to stream. We have people interacting uh, in South and Central America and now South Africa and Europe as well. So it's cool. We're a big event. It's fun. All right, so um, if you guys have more questions for Daniel, uh, track him down. Again, let's give a round of applause for Daniel. Thanks for, very much for coming. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Just click it right there. Um, so what we're going to do right now is we're going to take a break. Feel free to go run out, go to the bathrooms, visit vendors, whatever. Uh, when we have lunch ready, it'll be over here in this corner is where we'll come in, and we'll circle back through there. So we'll let you know when that's, that's going. We'll have some music and hang out in here, chat in here if you want. Um, go grumble about not getting DerbyCon tickets, whatever, you, or go sack the two guys that did. Enjoy. Oh, we're, are we ready? Hey, lunch. look at that. Lunch is ready, by the way. If you have dietary concerns, uh, just all that stuff is set up in there as well. All right, thanks very much.